In the previous video, I mentioned Freud's theory of the family romance as a common motif in children's fantasy literature. Another one of Freud's theories, perhaps his most famous, the Oedipus Complex, has some explaining power as well for what we are about to examine. Through his concept of the Oedipus Complex, Freud theorized that children experience a desire for the parent of the opposite sex, and therefore feel themselves to be in competition with the parent of the same sex. According to Freud, this is the genesis of all our negative emotions. This is where we all first encounter feelings of guilt, shame, and resentment in our early development. The theory borrows its name from Oedipus Rex, the mythological Greek king of Thebes. In the tragic plays of Sophocles, Oedipus unwittingly kills his father and marries his mother. Once the truth of what he has done is revealed to him, Oedipus is overcome with grief and rage. He tears out his own eyes as an act of both repentance and revenge. Freud didn't think that the Oedipal complex was a unique pathology only affecting some individuals, but that it was an inevitable, universal part of the human condition, the ultimate origin of our anxieties and fears. He felt there were plenty of negative, pathological neuroses that can arise in individuals as a consequence of the Oedipus complex, if and when things go wrong. But if things progress as they should, it is simply a painful, though necessary, stage of our maturation. The envy, inferiority, and competition that a little boy may subconsciously feel for his father will eventually evolve into a sense of competition between themselves and other men of their generation. If a child is lucky, they'll have a benevolent father who encourages their growth, supports their natural talents, and hopes their son's achievements in life will someday exceed their own. Envy and inferiority disappear as a child comes of age and grows into their own adult body. A need and desire for the mother becomes supplanted with a need and desire for female peers. If things proceed accordingly and a child is raised within a healthy environment, the Oedipus complex can be seen as an essential training ground and dress rehearsal for adult relationships. This is, again, Freud's theory, and not one I'm necessarily fully endorsing. Most of Freud's theories are viewed more as a form of fanciful literary criticism than they are any kind of empirical behavioral science at this point. I'd go so far as to say they've been debunked, only I'm not sure I see how a theory such as this could ever be proven to be empirically, objectively true to begin with. However, the fact that so many people today remain aware of the theory of the Oedipus Complex does suggest to me that it resonates and has some authentic, descriptive power, if only a figurative and metaphorical power. Freud also used the Oedipus Complex to explain why men were compelled to achieve greater things than their fathers, thus making them stronger, worthier objects for their mother's affections. Through what Freud termed sublimation, the redirecting of libido, of raw, sexual desire and primal energy towards other, more concrete and productive ends. This is the vital, primal force that has moved civilization forward, generation after generation. Thus, while King Philip II was merely the king of Macedon, his son, Alexander the Great, would create an empire spanning from India to Greece. This theory need not be reserved and applied merely to biological fathers. Men feel this anxiety for their forebears in whatever field or discipline in which they happen to compete. Famously, Freud would accuse his disciple Carl Jung of forming an Oedipus complex towards him once he broke with his theories and formed his own perspective on the human psyche. The literary critic Harold Bloom, in his famous book The Anxiety of Influence, makes the argument that if you find a poet to be clearly rejecting and moving in the opposite direction from a poet of a previous generation, stylistically or philosophically, that older poet is in fact their primary influence, father figure, and the predecessor who they both fear the most as well as revere the most, an Oedipal struggle if ever there was one. We can apply this to a figure like Tolkien, Tolkien had an obvious love and admiration for epic poetry and Anglo-Saxon literature, but can't one view his body of work as an attempt to outdo and outperform these poems and chronicles of the past? To create a piece of art more epic than the epics he spent a lifetime studying? 
As Freud's concept continued to saturate other disciplines, later thinkers would apply the Oedipus complex not only to non-biological father figures, but argue that it exists on a culture-wide level as well. While the Romans, for example, inherited much of their culture from the Greeks, this anxiety and sense of inferiority to Greek cultural achievements, to having been Hellenized, is what in fact drove and compelled Rome to conquer the world. The Magicians, a fantasy television series based on the novels by Lev Grossman, suffers greatly from an Oedipus complex. It is, however, a failed Oedipus complex, resulting in neurosis, arrested development, and a failure to overcome or outperform the fathers of the past. The series tells the story of Quentin Coldwater, a shy, neurotic, reclusive young man who recently graduated from Columbia University with a BA in literature. Since he was 10 years old, Coldwater has been obsessed with the Fillory and Further novels, a highly transparent analog to the Chronicles of Narnia. Just as their author, Christopher Plover, acts as an obvious hybrid of C.S. Lewis and Lewis Carroll, the Fillory books describe the adventures of the Chatwins, five children who discover a magical realm called Fillory while vacationing in the British countryside. Just as the Pevensey children discovered Narnia in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, after they were brought out to a country estate to evade German air raids. A sufferer of chronic depression, Quentin retreated to the Fillory books throughout his childhood and throughout his young adulthood as a method of escape. The book's depiction of magic facilitated an additional preoccupation of Quentin's, sleight of hand and magic parlor tricks. When we begin the series, Quentin has checked himself into a mental health clinic due to his worsening depression after having graduated college. While admitted to the clinic, Quentin resolves to get rid of all his copies of the Fillory books and overcome the grip that they have on his life. Despite a doctor's advice that he remain admitted to the hospital, he checks himself out after only a few days. He returns to his loft apartment where his childhood friend, Julian Wicker, is throwing a party. The following morning, both Julia and Quentin have graduate school interviews at Yale. I'll skip over some unnecessary details here. To quickly summarize, Quentin gets sidetracked from his interview. He comes across a manuscript for the allegedly lost, legendary, final book in the Fillory and Further series. One of the pages of the manuscript blows away, leading Quentin on a chase down an alley, into an abandoned lot, and finally, smack dab into a portal which transports Quentin to break Bill's university for magical pedagogy. Lo and behold, magic is indeed real. Rather than attending his graduate school interview in mundane reality, Quentin is subjected to and passes a rigorous entrance exam to break bills through the aid of his newly discovered magical powers, as does his friend Julia. Hogwarts, Harry Potter's school of witchcraft and wizardry, may immediately come to the listener's mind. However, I think comparing Hogwarts to Break Bills would risk overlooking many important differences. I hate to come anywhere close to doxing myself, but I'll admit to having a deep familiarity with the environment of preparatory schools. Hogwarts is a depiction of boarding school life without the, well, warts. Rowling's vision of prep school life is like something a local townie kid may have invented and nourished, passing by our gothic dormitories on a cold winter's night and, like some Dickensian street urchin, pressing their face to the glass to get a glimpse inside. They weren't able to perceive through the frost and the stained glass that we were all essentially Slytherin through and through. They couldn't see us beating our house servants, the insider training, the rampant cocaine abuse, the cults of Zinch, and the brutal Lord of the Flies style pecking order, the Masonic rituals, secret initiations, and oaths to Mephistopheles that routinely took place, at least within the boys' dorms. I'm sure the girls' dorms had their own unique forms of torment. Breakbills, on the other hand, and despite its magical properties, contains all of the blemishes and imperfections of a small ivy, private, liberal arts college. Veterans of such institutions will recall that, as an alternative to the Greek systems of larger universities, students typically organize themselves into theme houses 
While the themes of these houses are occasionally academic, for example, Spanish house or anthropology house, more often than not, these houses are unofficially organized by vice. Alcohol house, marijuana house, sex house, etc. On any given weekend, you could select which house's party to crash based on what sort of evening you desired. In a similar fashion, the students of Breakbills have organized their housing based on everyone's different, magical affinities. Quinton is assigned to the Physical Kids Cottage, where he soon meets his fellow telekinetic classmate, Alice Quinn, along with the upperclassmen Elliot Waugh and Margot Hansen. This will become the quartet of main characters throughout Season 1 of The Magicians. Much of the plot of Season 1 tracks Quinton and his friends' attempts to find their way to Fillory, one of many parallel magical realms within the Magician's multiverse. When they eventually do make their way to the Enchanted Realm, they are all anointed kings and queens of Fillory, just as happened to the Pevensey children in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Breakbill's similarities to contemporary liberal arts colleges doesn't simply end with the dorms. No vice of the modern college campus is absent from Breakbill's, as it is depicted in The Magicians. Professors have affairs with their students, undergrads stay up all night playing beer pong, abuse drugs under the guise of psychologically disorienting spells, and co-eds fail to shave their armpits as an act of political disobedience. Quentin and his classmates are all sullen, narcissistic, entitled, and, with the exception of Quentin, ungrateful and unimpressed with suddenly finding themselves at a supernatural college where all that is asked of them is to learn how to wield unspeakable magical powers. If I sound especially bitter during this video, I apologize. If it isn't obvious by now, I had to endure four years of college with this type of human being. If Harry Potter's Hogwarts is a shrine to childhood innocence, the Magician's Breakbills is a shrine to the listless hedonism of upper middle class young adulthood. I should pause here for a moment. In attempting to describe what I found so grating and flawed about the magicians, what makes my blood boil and what I find so objectionable, I realize that I risk appearing like someone who simply isn't in on the joke. Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer is, certainly, a secondary secondary world of sorts. As someone who went through their teenage years in the 90s, I'll always experience a certain affection loyalty, and nostalgia for this show, though there is of course plenty about the show to be embarrassed by, and I can see now, in hindsight, how much of Buffy was, at the very least, proto-progressive. Not unlike Hogwarts, Sunnydale is an environment that borrows heavily from pre-established myths from horror movies and gothic tales. Vampires, werewolves, witches, and so forth. Contrasting the darkness and otherworldly danger of these horror movie tropes with the mundanity of a California suburb, with the teenage self-absorption and frequent shallowness of Buffy and her friends, is what gave Buffy the Vampire Slayer its comedy, its campiness, and its charm. So isn't it maybe just the case that The Magicians is deploying a similar style and tone of storytelling? Contrasting the modern, cynical sensibilities of millennial undergraduates to the romanticism of myth and magic? Well, I certainly think that this was the intention of the magicians. The series without a doubt takes many of its cues from Joss Whedon's Buffyverse. However, while it may deploy the same storytelling techniques, it does not achieve the same tone or desired effects. The characters within Buffy certainly engage in just as much bad decision-making as the characters of the magicians. However, when Buffy and her high school classmates confront the supernatural elements of their world, the vampires and demons of Sunnydale, these trials and tribulations serve as personifications and symbolism for their own inner struggles with their emerging adulthoods. As they face the demons of their suburban town, they are, in effect, confronting matters of sex, of responsibility, and their fear of leaving behind their childhood imaginations which the show occasionally implies, is what gives life to said demons in the first place. I'm not sure if the Golden One would categorize Buffy as more of a Harry Potter or a Frodo figure. In terms of her origins, she certainly has her greatness merely handed to her, but throughout the show we see Buffy struggle with the weight and the burden of her growing adult responsibilities. At the end of the final season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
Buffy leaves Sunnydale and its supernatural elements, as well as her chosenness behind, prepared finally, it is implied, to join the adult world. In The Magicians, this polarity is reversed. Whereas Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a coming-of-age story, when we first encounter them, all of the main characters of The Magicians are firmly established within their young adulthoods. The viewer encounters Quentin in a flight from, not towards, reality, away from the challenges and vicissitudes and responsibilities of adult life, despite the fact that the only thing facing Quentin is acceptance at an Ivy League grad school where he can dedicate himself to the study of his favorite writer, this is still somehow too much reality and drudgery for him. The misadventures that Quentin and his classmates will undergo, magical or otherwise, are, unlike Buffy, a continual refusal, renunciation, and disavowal of adult life. The supernatural elements of the magicians are not presented as a comedic foil for its realistic elements themes to be juxtaposed or contrasted to create some unique flavor and tone. Rather, the magical and the real seem interchangeable, comparable. They blend together into a bland mush. A break build student might major in illusionary magic in the same way a college student in the real world might major in English or economics. Rather than smoking a joint, a break build student casts an enchantment on themselves. It is a distinction without a difference. Nor does The Magicians present what might be another acceptable and common theme within fantasy fiction, the preservation and celebration of innocence. Instead, The Magicians is merely a gaudy celebration of the squalid purgatory, directionless degeneracy, and arrested development of urbane 20-somethings. There are no winks and nods to the audience in The Magicians, no charming self-awareness or campiness as there is in Buffy. There is none of Joss Whedon's joke density, as these characters do not joke. These characters do not even smile. They all take themselves very seriously, despite there being no reason for them or the audience to do so. Compare our introduction to Quentin and his background to that of Harry Potter. When we meet Harry, he's living under the stairwell in the house of the malicious Dursleys. The cruelty that Harry endures at the hands of his aunt and uncle is so overdone so cartoonishly evil that we know we are already firmly within the world of children's literature before even setting foot onto the campus of Hogwarts. The Dursleys offer one cup of black comedy for every two cups of cruelty. They are adult villains that come to us directly out of the tradition of Roald Dahl. What we learn of Quentin's childhood is not softened with any such literary hyperbole. His depression is simply the product of his childhood endured in the wake of his parents' quotidian baby boomer divorce. Rather than meeting Quentin under an impossibly cruel Dickensian stairwell, we meet him in the all too real environment of a mental institution. Despite all of the magical elements of the storytelling in The Magicians, the show remains equally drenched in medical, quantitative, clinical language. Even after Quentin escapes into the world of break bills, he remains defined and categorized as someone who suffers from the mental illness of depression. Break bills doesn't manage to cause any break in Quentin being defined and defining himself through the lens and language of modern psychiatry, through the psychological categories of what Mark Fisher termed privatized stress. It would seem to me to be a perfectly acceptable theme or motif for a work of fantasy dealing with the question of mental illness to say, it's not our hero Quentin who is ill, but the modern world that is ill. It's not that Quentin is depressed, it's that the environment, the modern world, and his social atomization causes depression. And yet, Quentin's sadness and dissatisfaction is never viewed as anything environmental, as an inevitable and understandable outcome of the type of spaces, institutions, relationships, and subjectivity that he was subject to within non-magical reality. A change in his environment offers no cure, no salvation, and no real critique of the society that Quentin longed to escape. Throughout the series, Quentin's continuing, unalleviated depression is described as hereditary, inevitable, neurochemical, and merely personal. None of these characters are innocent children, nor are they in the process of sacrificing their innocence in order to gain the mantle of adult responsibility. 
Their Oedipal journeys are never so much as begun. All of the subplots of season one are as squalid as the environment of Breakbills itself, and simply involve the repetitive, self-destructive behaviors of Quentin and his classmates, as they harm both themselves as well as one another. Let's examine just a few of these now. In season one, Quentin eventually enters into a romantic relationship with Alice Quinn. After attempting to master certain spells causes Quentin, Elliot, and Margot to become psychologically disoriented, the three end up in bed together. Quentin blames his clinical depression for making him more vulnerable to the psychic side effects of the spellcasting. Alice discovers them together and immediately terminates the relationship. While such an experience would leave anyone emotionally scarred, it seems particularly wounding to Alice, given her own childhood. In an earlier episode, we met Alice's parents, a pair of sexually libertine magician swingers who used to throw orgies and sex parties at their home, all in earshot of young Alice and her brother. Alice's backstory gives her the best excuse of any of the characters to be unemotive, fragile, and expressionless. But the fact is that this is a description of nearly every main character in the show. The one exception to this is William Penny Adioti, Quentin's roommate. Penny's main character trait seems to be constantly verbally abusing Quentin for his white privilege, like an affirmative action student at an Ivy League school with an inferiority complex. It's something that Quentin always acquiesces to like a battered dog. If I can attempt to read Lev Grossman's mind, I imagine he finds Quentin's tolerance of this to be his one and only heroic trait. Penny seems to be a character that has sprung out of Grossman's subconscious guilt over daring to write a book which foregrounds the imaginations and experience of upper middle class whites and his shameful fascination with the European literary tradition. But back to the matter at hand. This sin of Quentin's is yet another obvious Narnia parallel, specifically the sin of Edmund Pevensey, the youngest male sibling in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Edmund's sin is consuming the enchanted food, Turkish Delight, that the White Witch feeds him in order to gain power over him, causing Edmund to betray his brother and sisters. In The Magicians, this childish sin has been upgraded and given a more adult veneer involving psychedelic drugs, sex, and infidelity. But unlike with Edmund, there is no redemption for Quentin. And unlike with the Narnia Chronicles, there's no sense of any innocence having been lost. Later on, when the four friends eventually find their way to Fillory and become kings and queens of the realm, Elliot is given the title of High King, just as Peter Pevensey was crowned High King in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Once Elliot, in his new role, begins to deal with the problems facing Fillory, he learns that all their crops are dying. All of Fillory's agriculture was produced using a magic enchantment which has recently ceased. And so the foppish, aristocratic Elliot is forced to disdainfully reveal his deepest, darkest secret. He was born and raised on a farm in rural Indiana by, of course, naturally, racist and homophobic, parents, and has actual first-hand knowledge about how to grow vegetables. The crowning of these characters as kings and queens of Fillory marks no real turning point or evolution in their character. In The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, the Pevensey children were made kings and queens of an Eden of sorts, of a garden of innocence in which they could fully experience their childhoods, cloistered and uncorrupted by the adult world. The Pevenseys aren't granted re-entry into Narnia once they have passed a certain age, but the magician's crowns are neither crowns of innocence nor crowns of experience. They are merely crowns of pretenders, in every sense of that word. Once he is crowned High King, Elliot spends most of his time complaining about how his royal marriage causes him guilt and inhibits his pursuit of sex. In another subplot, Quentin's best friend Julia Wicker has been expelled from Breakbills. She attempts to summon the goddess Persephone, played by a black woman, to petition her and gain re-entry into Breakbills. Unfortunately, Julia fails in her attempt and instead mistakenly summons the trickster god Reynard the Fox played by a white man, who immediately proceeds to violently rape Julia, impregnating her. Much of Julia's plotline then revolves around seeking and failing to find someone willing and able to administer a magical abortion strong enough to kill a demonic fetus. It's honestly a bit refreshing to see the show take a pause from reappropriating, corrupting, 
and mocking elements from earlier fantasy literature, to instead just be hit over the head with a heavy-handed allegory and a common what-if scenario from current culture war polemics surrounding race and contraception. At one point, Quentin and Alice discover a book containing instructions on how to cast a battle magic spell created by Japanese magicians called Magiku Misoru. Magic Missile? Quentin exclaims, immediately recognizing the name. That's like straight up Dungeons and Dragons. In her essay, Harry Potter and the Childish Adult, A.S. Byatt lamented that millennial readers don't have the skills to tell Ersatz magic from the real thing. I believe that Quentin takes this a step further, in that when encountering the real thing, magic itself, he can only connect to it and come in contact with it by immediately retreating to its Ersatz counterpart. I hesitate to bring up this comparison, but this put me in mind of a phenomena I once heard Slavo Zizek describe. It is apparently not at all uncommon for porn stars to view pornography in order to remain aroused, while on set filming porn scenes. It's not so much that the thing in itself, be it magic or sex, isn't recognized, so much as it is simply not providing enough stimulation. I want to take a minute to examine Fillory itself. The magician's first flight from reality, its secondary secondary world, is the campus of Breakbills. But no sooner has Quentin entered that environment that the gloss and glamour begins to wear off, if it was ever really there. And he begins his quest to find Fillory. As I journeyed with the magicians on their quest to locate Fillory, I asked myself, will we finally encounter the Numinous? Something truly otherworldly? Somewhere less tainted by the modern, by the recognizable, the petty and the mundane, in the manner that Break Bill's campus was? But when they finally break through to Fillory, we see that it is nothing but yet another secondary secondary world. I suppose, technically speaking, a secondary 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 world. While Fillory is certainly a more ancient, wild, medieval, and beautific world, still, it is sullied and spoiled. The reason for Fillory being so intoxicating is rationalized due to its atmosphere being partly constituted of opioids. Instead of being ruled over by a benevolent Aslan, Fillory is ruled by the twin gods Ember and Umber. Ember is a goat-horned, satyr-like figure. When Quentin and Julia petition him for aid, he grants Alice divine empowerment, which takes the form of drinking his sperm. Hence, sex and drugs reign over Fillory and permeate the setting just as fully as they did break bills. And so we can see that the nature of Lev Grossman's Oedipal struggle with his fantasy writer forebearers is a strange one indeed. In The Silmarillion, J.R.R. Tolkien said of Morgoth, essentially Middle-earth's Lucifer, that evil cannot create anything new. It can only corrupt and ruin what good forces have invented or made. I'm tempted to coin a new term here and state that Lev Grossman has a Morgoth complex. However, I'm too fond of the content creator by that name. So what about Golem instead? Just as Golem both loves and hates the ring, so too does Grossman appear to both love and hate the largely male and European men who created the canon of literature from which he draws. No sooner does he drink from this well than he spits out its water. Another odious example of a golem complex, and one I encountered long before I ever encountered the magicians, is the podcast Welcome to Night Vale. Night Vale owes its inspiration entirely to the work of H.P. Lovecraft and the genre of cosmic horror which he established. The only new contribution Welcome to Night Vale makes to cosmic horror is a patina of progressive politics delivered in a gay lisp. It takes every opportunity to mock Lovecraft's racism, xenophobia, and paranoia, while simultaneously owing its very existence to his work. Despite what anyone may think about those traits of his personality, they are a large part of what informed his fiction and brought it into being. Night Vale exists entirely within the genre of cosmic horror, while denying all of its darker metaphysical assertions and implications. Night Vale both hates and loves Lovecraft. He is simultaneously their god and their devil, just as Grossman appears to both hate and love Lewis.
And really, if one's ambition is to illustrate the Golem Complex, you could not find a more perfect subject than the contemporary American liberal arts student. College undergraduates are asked to simultaneously breathe in the rarefied air of a college campus in all its splendor, while being taught that the very fact that they are there, their privilege, is both evil and unearned. Nowhere is this duality more clear within the magicians than in the figure of Christopher Plover, the famous author of the Fillory and Further novels, and Quentin's favorite writer. Plover is a composite sketch of both C.S. Lewis and Lewis Carroll. The Pevensey children, the heroes of the Chronicles of Narnia, were inspired and based on actual children who came to live with Lewis during the Blitz in World War II. Similarly, in The Magicians, Plover based his Chatwin family on actual children of that name, who lived nearby and would recount their adventures in a fantastical world to him. Here is the twist. It is eventually revealed that Plover was a child molester who abused the Chatwin children, most especially Martin Chatwin, who then went on to adopt the name The Beast, grow into an incredibly evil and powerful magician, the most feared creature within Fillory, as well as the primary antagonist of season one. Given his well-recorded and Baroque racism, Lovecraft is a far easier target for condemnation than Lewis. And so, despite owing his entire inspiration for his world-building to the work of C.S. Lewis, and the magicians really has nothing to offer whatsoever if you remove the influence of Lewis, Grossman seems fit to borrow an accusation of pedophilia leveled at an earlier children's fantasy writer, Lewis Carroll, and graft it onto the character of Plover. I cannot emphasize enough how this was merely alleged of Lewis Carroll and never proven in the slightest whatsoever. Grossman is reduced to this because he has to find somewhere in his world in which to locate evil and to explain to his audience why things are in such a fallen state, lest we begin to look at the decisions, the morality, and the ideology of his sullen, broken anti-heroes. The young adults who populate the magicians are all sad and miserable because they are all a product of liberalism, and yet none of them have the necessary tools the first of which would be a modicum of self-awareness, to seek alternatives to liberalism. Having been taught their whole lives that anything that predates liberalism was the epitome of evil, the characters are left with an admiration for the past, a vague sense of a world less fallen that may have contained more order and stability, and yet they can't grant themselves permission to fully seek or embrace it. Might an admiration and fascination with an ancient form of governance, such as monarchy, entail a certain reverence for paternalism, for responsibility, for hierarchies, for the idea of becoming worthy, of acting with generosity and nobility towards those over whom one rules? Might the worship and petitioning of Persephone, the goddess of spring and nature, come with the prerequisite of a reverence for birth and for life? Might an encounter with the numinous first require the ability to distinguish the sacred from the profane? Just what is it, specifically, that Grossman seems to despise about Lewis's metaphysics, about his worldview? Well, ultimately, I think he resents Lewis's ability to differentiate and separate childhood from adulthood, and to thereby honor both. I think it's telling that a great many of the characters, at least those whose backgrounds we get to learn about, are products of divorce. Growing up, Grossman's magicians never had a chance to indulge in Freud's family romance, since their families dissolved before they were ever old enough to partake in a natural and harmless fantasy about escaping from them. The main characters can't manage to redirect libido towards anything concrete or productive, because they have only known libido as a source of instability. They lack any vision of the good. They can't assume responsibility or swear an oath that they can take seriously because this isn't anything they ever had modeled for them. Their parents dissolved their oaths to one another and repeatedly tore down all the guardrails that should have been defending their childhoods. It's been decades since entering college or having sex signified a clear transition to adulthood in any meaningful way. Not even assuming the mantle of kings and queens can come to signify adulthood for Quentin or any of his classmates. 
They have been robbed of every ritual and every opportunity that might have at one time signified a passage into adulthood. The adults around them failed to recognize and honor their childhoods, just as now they fail to help them enter their maturity. The theme that runs through the magicians most thoroughly is that of adult betrayal. There are no adults that the magicians can admire, let alone trust. Even Plover, Grossman's proxy for Lewis, whose books offered such a profound source of comfort for Quentin during his childhood, can't be shown to have an interest in children and in children's literature that is pure. It has to be revealed as illicit and profane, because Grossman can't conceive of an adult role model who does not ultimately fail, betray, harm, and degrade children. Like Oedipus blinding himself, Lev Grossman's The Magicians seems to be a simultaneous act of revenge and self-mutilation. Grossman clearly loves the children's fantasy literature of the West, and yet he seeks to discredit it. And like Oedipus, Grossman is blind. Blind to the fact that what he admires artistically has been destroyed, eroded, and undermined by what he has been taught to admire politically. He is also blind to the fact that, as he proceeded to mock, betray, and degrade the legacy of Lewis's fiction, he managed to perfectly exemplify the points that Lewis set out to make in his nonfiction, in his famous essay, The Abolition of Man. But that's something we'll explore in the next concluding video.